everybody. We are we were in a series called You Asked For It. We spoke about um, hell and heaven a little bit. And today what we're doing is citizens of heaven. We're going to talk about heaven. A lot of you all had questions about it, and it was just so much to cover in one sermon. I just can't do it. And it's so important to understand heaven and what's going to happen at the end of our lives. Very important. A lot of people will spend more time planning their vacation than their eternity. And so, truth of the matter is, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, he's planted eternity into hearts. Everyone longs to know there's something else. And so today, we're going to look at what the Bible says about eternity. And I, how many of you ever heard someone say, well, he's so heavenly minded, there's no earthly good, right? And what that usually means is that someone is just using religious jargon. You know what I'm talking about, religious jargon. Oh, praise the Lord, hallelujah, and, and they never deal with reality. We're not talking about that. Truth of the matter is this. Those that are, so, those that are earthly minded are no earthly good either. You see, truly, those that are heavenly minded are the most earthly good because they are going for a goal that is bigger and greater than the earth, and they shoot higher than the earth and make more of an impact because they understand that our time here on the earth is limited. So today we're going to talk about that. Today we're talking about a little bit of heaven and about judgment. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Uh, I would, I would be, I'd be doing malpractice as a, a person who preaches the word of God without telling you the whole story. Truth of the matter is that God loves us so much. And hell is not something God has designed us to be for and go towards. It's not his design. In fact, the fact that you're alive and breathing today is an indication how much God loves you and how he wants to have fellowship with you. And he has no desire to see anyone go to a place called hell. And that's why God sent himself, Jesus. He sent Jesus to pay for our sins. Because all of us have fallen short of God's standards. There's not one that's righteous, no, not one. And Jesus loves us so much that he came to earth to take our place on the cross so we could be with God forevermore. You see, if it didn't matter, God would have sent somebody else. He did not come to give you the American dream. He did not come to make your dog stop barking or your cat stop meowing, or your kids to behave. He did not come to make you happy. He came to save you. Why? God loves you so much. He really, really does. For God so loved the world. He loves you, and he desires to know you. You've been created by God for God, and until you give your life to God, you're going to hurt yourself and other people. You see, our design has always been for God. And we have an enemy out there. He wants to trick us and getting us living for ourselves and living off kilter and getting us to live off our design so we can hurt ourselves and hurt each other. Look what's going on in the world today. So today we're going to be talking about and looking at what the Bible says that one day we're going to have to give an account for our lives. Oh, great. I don't like this. Well, listen, anyone that talks about hell or preaches about hell and enjoys it's got problems. Hell is a real place. In fact, people in, I was reading just recently, and the, the latest Gallup poll says the following. In, in 2023, 67% of Americans believe in heaven and 60% believe in hell. But back in 2014, it was 72% believed in heaven and 71 hell. So about 10 percentage points have dropped in the last 10 years where more people are laying aside what they believe about God. Have you noticed how crime has gone up? More troubles has come up? More anxiety has happened as a result of society? The more brokenness we are? Why? Because we're designed by God for God. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about that. In fact, America's believe in heaven is a place where people who have led good lives eventually go. But good people don't go to heaven. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. That's good news. Because if any of you think you have it all together, you don't. In fact, if I had the capacity, if I could lock these doors, which I'm not going to do, and Elon Musk sent me Neuralink helmets, 
the latest and greatest. If you put, you need to pay attention now. <laughs> that was a PowerPoint. And we could put a Neuralink on your head, right? Imagine if we could do this. What we would do is we could extract all your memories. And this is what we would do. We're going to exclusively take all the things you thought about people you didn't want knowing about you. And we're, next week, we're going to invite all the people that you thought bad thoughts about on that screen. And we're going to hear everything you've ever said. How many of you would come back to church to watch that video? I'd be gone, right? Why is that? Because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know what sin means? Homartio in the Greek means you missed the mark. And we punish people all the time in our society today. There is a call for justice when something goes wrong, right? Why is that? We're made in God's image. And God loves us too much to let sin go forever. So what does all this mean for us today? If this is not some archaic thing, a Dante's Inferno. No, this is beyond that. You see, hell is not a place what you think it really is. We're next week, we're going to go to hell. This week, we're going to go to heaven. Okay, next week, we're going to talk about hell. So you don't want to miss, you don't want to miss hell next week. No, next week, <laughs> it's not a laughing matter, stop. Then the next week, we're going to talk about heaven and hell and the characteristics of both, okay? So what we believe about eternity determines how we live today. What we believe about eternity determines how we live today. If we don't think about eternity, then whatever you think about, whatever you put your eyes upon, you will drive towards. So if you're driving towards this earth, if you're driving towards success, if you're driving towards various things, you'll drive there. So whatever you're thinking about, you will drive towards. So what are we occupying our thoughts and minds with today? Would I, would I tell you today, would you not agree with me that today in America... Generally speaking, of course, our society is a little bit materialistic. Would you, sit, would you think maybe that might be the case? Absolutely. We live in a very materialistic culture where we worship wealth, power, and prestige. Right? We do. And we're trained by that. And if you're not aware that we're living in a culture that is trying to get you to want things more than people, you're mistaken. There's whole advertising agencies out there trying to create algorithms to get you to get a desire and a hunger to thirst and look for things so you can buy things. And we've been trained this as a culture. If you don't think you've been affected by that, you're wrong because we are living in the secondhand smoke of materialism. Just like if you go to a place where they're smoking cigarettes or campfire and the campfire, you may not be on fire, but the smoke of the campfire gets all over you and you have to clean your clothes and take a shower to get rid of it. Just being in this materialistic world, it gets on your clothing, it gets in your nostrils, and if you're not aware of it, you lose the capacity to smell the smoke of materialism and you and I can be t taken away the wrong way. And the church has been guilty of this. There have been pastors and preachers and movements. It's all about getting things, all about prestige, all about who's got the greatest church, who's got the greatest ministry. It's all about this instead of heaven. And so we have to. That's why it's important every way, every day to get into the Word. The Bible says in Ephesians, husbands, wash your wives with the Word. And so there's something about getting into the Word of God where we wash off the secondhand smoke of this culture. So what we believe about eternity determines how we live today. One of the most important things you can think about is what you think about yourself and what you think about God. In this order, what you think about God and what you think about yourself determines how you live your life. So... But I don't think about God. Huh? If you don't think about God, guess who's God? Thank you. All right. I'm going to share a story with you. This is Jesus. I think Jesus is telling us about a man who's basically living the American dream. Uh, America was not even created yet. Yet Jesus is explaining the American dream perhaps better than any passage in America today and any passage in the Bible. This passage right here, we're going to look at, which is a parable, talks about what you and I aspire to be. And I'll have to be frank with you, even though my name is Eric, some of it is true. I am looking for this too. Are you guys ready? Are you ready to be offended? Good. Okay. And he told them a parable saying, 
the land of a what? Rich man. That's always the rich man. A rich man is someone else that's not you, right? If you make $45,000 as an individual, you are on the top 1% of those in the world. That makes you rich. No, my name is Eric. Huh? So listen, everybody. You don't realize it, but in America, generally speaking, we're rich. We're rich. Okay, that's annoying. Okay. And he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced plentiful. And he thought to himself, what shall I do for I have nowhere to store my crops? Now, wouldn't that be nice? Now, there's no one in this church that has to get a, get a storage unit to put their stuff, right? No one has a basement full of stuff that your wife wants you to throw away. That you, you say, I'm not letting get over that sweatshirt I wore in college. I'm going to wear it to the day I die. I got my books. I got everything. I got my CDs. Not, I wish they were CDs. They're not CDs. They're the, the little dips. You know what a CD is? It's like a metal. Okay. Cassettes. Okay. Age? No, not age. I'm not that old. I'm not that old. Okay, back in those days. Okay. And he told them a parable of a land where a rich man produced plentiful and thought to himself, what shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. And so who's almost like Louis Armstrong, you know? He said, and I said to myself, what a wonderful life. You know, he said, I got a wonderful life. He's doing great, right? I have so much. What am I going to do? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns, and I will build bigger ones, and then I will store all my grain and goods. Now, what on earth is wrong with that? Right? He's worked hard. He's got all these goods and all these wonderful things, and he's going to make bigger barns. Now, let's be honest. We go to financial planners, or we plan ourselves. We have a 401K. We have CDs. We have stock options, right? We have uh, the Roth accounts. We have all these things we're setting up, right? Because one day, we want to say to ourselves, Wait, we all want to say a wonderful, wonderful life, right? We want to sit on the porch someplace. We want to be in a golf course someplace. And we want to say, I don't work for the old man anymore. I work for myself. I'm just going to kick back and relax and enjoy my life. Is that not the American dream? I'm going to go ahead. Someone give me a different mic. I've, I've had enough with this thing. Okay. When they come out, they'll be great. Uh, and he said, I by the way, I'm not making a command. I'm making a suggestion. Okay. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and I will build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to myself, soul, what a wonderful. All right. You have ample goods laid up for many years. Is that not a job of a financial planner? A good, thank you so much. Give it up. All right. Just give me a second. I'm not undressing. Don't worry. Now I'm free. The leash is off. Look out. Okay. But is this not what we want? I, I mean, I want to be able to retire, right? I want to be able not to worry about things anymore and be able to, for the rest of my life, I have enough money in my account. I can live, I have a, it takes about $3 million, they say these days, to really live comfortably <laughs> when you retire, you know. So I, I'm going to go ahead and say, I'm going to relax, eat, drink, and be married. This is not what we want to do. Is it bad to have those desires? Is it bad to have the American dream? Is it bad to retire? Is it bad to be on the golf course? Is it bad to go on cruises? Is it bad to travel around the country and enjoy yourself in an RV with, a, with, a, uh, with your spouse or something? Is that a bad thing? Why is Jesus picking on this guy? Well, hang on. But God said to him, what? Fool. This night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, those will... They, where were they, excuse me, and the things which you have prepared, whose will they be? The government. <laughs> so this is the one who what? Lays up treasures for himself and is not rich 
towards God. Okay, the problem here is not the fact the Bible says a wise man needs an inheritance for his children's children. So we're not talking about not investing. That's not what we're talking about. Where is this man's heart? This man is not really interested in the kingdom of heaven. He's in the kingdom of himself. And let's be honest, we are often interested in the kingdom of ourselves. It's all about retirement, as if that's all there is. My friends, retirement is nothing but a waiting room for death. There's more to life than just gathering things and dying. You see, you're created with a vision, for, you're created with on purpose, with a purpose. You're created to make a difference in the world. The reason why we're here as a church is not so we can gather things, gather more toys, and do well and die and live for ourselves. God has you on here on mission. You see, we get frustrated by reading the papers and reading the Internet and looking at all the things going on in the world. We're frustrated with Washington, D.C. We're frustrated with the politics. We're frustrated with world events, and we get all upset about it and talk about it and crank about it and text about it and, and social media about it. But what, guess what we often do? We ignore where God has placed us. Do you realize that all of you are called into the ministry if you give your life to Jesus? That your parish, if you will, all of us have a responsibility. And if you want to see the world change, the best way we can um, change the world is, is changing where God has placed you. The most authority, the most power, the most strength, and the most, most impact that you have is where God's placed you. It includes your town, your family, your workplace, your church, and your community. We're so worried about Washington, D.C. and what's going on on the Gaza Strip. That's important, but we forget what's across the street. And so we get distracted by things that don't matter. God has a mission and purpose for us. It's not about you gathering things so you can have a lot of stuff and die happy. That's not why you're here. You're here on mission with a mission, and until you understand that, you can waste your life and get it to the end and have nothing to show for it. You see, everybody, the world changes one life at a time. If all of us would do our part, if all of us would just make a change where God has placed us and be the Jesus where he placed us, the world would change. The country would have revival. But we're too distracted by what's going on in other places. Or we're too distracted trying to live the American dream and being in debt. You know, they said the average American makes about 80,000, uh, the government, for excuse me, this was a couple of years ago, but if you want to, um, give an illustration about how our country is living. Imagine someone making $80,000 a year, but their expenses are $140,000 a year. How long is that going to last? Well, that's what America used to be like. I don't know what it is now. We keep trying more and more debt. We're spending more than we take in as a culture. Why? Because we want materialism. We do. We have to understand what God says here. He said to the man, you fool. Why? Those who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. Now, what does this have to do with heaven and hell? Well, he says your soul is required of you. You see, Jesus says, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself, what, treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in. This is a return on an eternal investment. One day, you and I are going to be judged how we live our lives. You see, what we believe about eternity determines how we live today. You see, in Colossians, it says this. This is important, everybody. You have to live, if, if you're going to live a successful Christian life, we have to get our eyes off of this world so we can live above this world and greater than this world. You cannot supersede heaven if you're looking at earth. The only way you and I can live beyond this earth is to look beyond this earth and to live for God Almighty. You see, this is what the Bible says in Colossians 3, 1 through 2. Since you have been raised to new life, if you're a believer, what does it say, Christ? What does it say? Set your sights on the American dream. What does it say? Set your sights on the realities of heaven. Do you realize that this earth is a vapor? It is a blink of an eye. It, I mean, it actually, the, even the word blink of an eye is actually not a good translation. It's actually when light goes into your eye you, and it registers in your brain, that's how quick this life is. This life is quick. And so the, the Bible says, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. 
Because if we, whatever you think about, whatever you look at, whatever you focus, you will drive towards. Now, why is the Bible saying this for? Is God a killjoy? He just wants to ruin us. Well, God is the one that, does, that gave you taste buds. He's the one that helps you to enjoy the donuts when you walk out of here today, right? God gave us taste buds so we can enjoy pizza, right? God gave us taste buds. He gave us, he gave us all these things that we have to enjoy life. His job is that we have an abundant life in him. The enemy comes and takes what God has and distorts it and uses it in a way to destroy ourselves. Okay? So, so focus. What does he say? This is, a, this, by the way, in the Greek tense of the um, New Testament, this is uh, translated in English, but it's really in Greek, koinonia. It says, set your sights. It literally means like a marksman, like a sharpshooter that's setting his sights and has the crosshairs on a target. Setting his sights not like Charlie Brown. You know what Charlie Brown does in Peanuts? He shoots an arrow, and then he gets a magic mark and draws a target where he shot it. That's not how you live a life worth living. Keep your focus on where? Set your sights on the realities of heaven. Heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor, God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Whatever you think about, you will drive towards and you will, you will actually, your neurotransmitters and your, your, um, your mind neuroplasticity will change based upon what you think. So if you're constantly looking at your neighbor and what they're doing for vacation, because right now, people are going on vacations right now, and social media, you keep comparing yourself to what else someone else is wearing. I can't believe they were that on the beach. Yeah, because you can't get away with it. Anyhow, so you look at those things, you criticize people, you look where they go on vacation, you judge their grandkids, you judge their vacation homes, you judge where they're at. Why? And you have all this anxiety. I'm not measuring up. I blew my life. My kids are not doing well. Forget all that. That is so vain and so silly. Comparison will ruin your life. Instead, think about the things of heaven. Think about God. Think about what God's calling you to do. And the best is yet to come in Christ Jesus. It really is. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. You see, nevertheless, Jesus tells his disciples. No, this is one of the key components that if you and I will get a hold of this, this will change your life radically. What I'm about ready to share right now will can absolutely change your life. I'm not just saying it to get your attention. Because Jesus said it. Jesus was there for three and a half years. He had disciples. He trained these 70 people. He, changed his, he trained his disciples by what he do. He did the work of the ministry. He trained them. They were with Jesus. So, okay, guys, this is what it is. Now, I want you to go do what I just did. So he gave them authority, and he sent them out. So they went out on their, one of the first things they did. And they went out and they preached about the kingdom of heaven. They cast out demons. People gave their lives to God. It was amazing. People were healed. Uh, demons were cast out. And they were doing the stuff that Jesus could do. And they came back ecstatic. They were having a party. Okay. They were having a good time. They're, they're rejoicing. And Jesus also is happy too. He says, praise God, I saw Satan fall like lightning, and nothing shall be able to overtake you. So they're all rejoicing about the, the success they had in the ministry. Is that not a good thing? Of course it is, right? But this is what he says. Pay attention to this. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In other words, guys, I understand things are going well. But don't base your happiness on happenstance. Base it on the joy of heaven because all of you guys are going to die a martyr's death except for John. And John's going to be boiled in oil. It's going to be tough. There are going to be days when the church grows and when people, uh, and things go well, people are healed, great things happen. And there are going to be days where you walk away no one is healed and you're put in prison and you're beaten with rods and you're left for dead and you're hung upside down. There are going to be days where you think, I can't handle this anymore. Anymore. Why? Jesus says, do not base your happiness on happenstance. Don't base it on ministry success, but base it on your position of who you are in heaven. Why did Jesus say that? Because he knew the truth. Jesus, it says in Hebrews, for the joy set before him endured the cross. If Jesus was looking for ministerial success, 
having a good group of disciples and all that. And he looked at that, he would be really depressed. But what did he do? He fixed his eyes for the joy set before him. My friends, the only way you and I can navigate this life is to set our affections on God in heaven. Now, does it mean we don't enjoy life? No. Basically, it's this. If you, for example, if I base all my success on how good the church is doing, oh boy. Sometimes it goes well, and sometimes it doesn't go well, right? So if I base it upon, no, no. My foundation is built in my, on who I am in Christ. I am a child of God, and I am guaranteed to be with God in heaven. I'm going to be with God forevermore. That's the joy of my salvation. No matter how bad it gets, the best is always ahead for those in Christ Jesus. The best is always ahead for those in Christ Jesus. I have a future. I have a hope, unmovable, unshakable. Now, that's the foundation. Now, I can enjoy and ministerial success. I can enjoy my kids doing well. And now on the foundation of heaven, I now enjoy my success here on earth in its proper context. But if I switch that around and it's all based upon how, how my kids are doing or how my marriage is doing or how the church is doing, look out. So Jesus is actually doing us a favor. He's helping us to build a foundation that cannot be shaken. How many of you like to have a foundation that cannot be shaken? All three of you. I'm not rejoicing at your clap. I'm rejoicing my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Because I'm rejoicing at clapping, I'm going to be very depressed. So nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, but that in the spiritual subject to you. But rejoice that your names are written in heaven. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is that you and I will have the joy of our salvation. We need to understand about heaven. The problem is a lot of us are uneducated about heaven. We don't even know what heaven's about. That's why next week I'm going to talk about heaven and a little bit about hell so you can actually look forward to things. There are good things coming, everybody. Good things are coming. I mean, really good things are coming. And so I have a little illustration I want to give you, but I can't because the next service is coming. One day, we will stand before God alone and face judgment. One day, we will stand before God and face judgment. Your father's not there. Your mother's not there. Your brother's not there. Your pastor's not there. Your favorite author's not there. It's going to be you and God alone to give an account about your life. How many of you are happy about that one? I'm not very happy about that without Jesus. I'm, I'm cooked. I'm done. We gave the illustration of the Neuralink helmet and seeing all that you have in your mind, right? Okay, so one day we'll stand before God. Now, this is what we talked about last week. When you die, three things happen. Your body returns to the dust. Your spirit returns to God who gave it if you're a believer. Spirit goes to either paradise or Hades until the last judgment. So we're going to go to a place. So there's different states of heaven. Uh, paradise is, this is the good news, when we die, we're with Jesus. Let me give you a little illustration here, okay? Now, what I've done here is <laughs> pretty impressive, I know, it's amazing. It's a <laughs> I'm a graphic artist, I didn't realize it. But what I have in yellow are non-negotiables. The Bible is explicitly clear on these things, okay? This is the things that really matter. The other parts of the end times are, are, are still important, but they don't matter as much as these. Because this is, this is what Jesus talks about. Not for you to know the times or the epochs the Father has, has set before him, but this is all what you ought to do. Preach the gospel. And so Jesus died on the cross. And so that those that die, right, to be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. So if someone dies, the man on the cross, go to paradise with Jesus. It's appointed to man to die once, then comes the judgment. When you die, that's the end. There's no, re, there's no takeover. You can't redo the test. I'm sorry. When you die, that's the end. There's no chance. The Bible says it's appointed for man and woman to die once. Then comes the judgment. Where's the judgment? The great right throne. So what happens is when we die, we go to a place called paradise. I talked a little bit about it last week. Go listen to it. You'll get a better idea what I'm talking about. So that's what happens. Now, if you're not of Christ, you go to a place called hell or Hades. And that's a holding tank. It's like a county jail until you go to the big house, until you go to the judge. So one day you'll be judged. Now, the second coming of Christ uh, what happens then when Christ comes back, they said the dead will, and Christ will rise first and meet him in the air, and then they'll all come down together in our glorified bodies. 
Then you'll have the glorified body. What kind of body do you have in paradise? Well, apparently, you can taste, you can feel, you can touch. We'll get into that next week. So you come back next week. I'll tease you with that one. Okay, so we have paradise in heaven. Then we have the second coming of Christ. When Christ comes back, he, ju he judges the earth. And there's, later on, there's a great white throne of judgment where every human being is judged. If you do not have the blood of Jesus, if you've not given your life to Jesus, then either you go to a new heavens and new earth or you go to a final hell called the lake of fire. Now, let me show you the next slide. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be re uh, remembered or come to mind. He's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. All right? Now, let me show you this a little bit. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away, and the sea was no more. Now, what I showed you in orange are different theories. And I could, I, could, I could argue each one really, really well. And so rather than get caught up, is it important? Yes, but it's not essential. The yellow is essential. The orange is important to know and helps us navigate, but it's not going to give you heaven or hell. You follow me, everybody. You're going to die one day. You can't retake the test, and you're going to have to stand before God one day, new heaven, new earth. That's the, really the most important thing you need to know. These other things are interesting, and we're not going to get into today. The pre, mid, post, rapture, millennium, tribulation, what does it happen? Uh, don't worry about it right now, but these are the yellow things. They're important, okay? And I'm not making light of these things in orange, but they're not essential. They're important, but they're not essential. You got it? Okay, thank you. All right. We will all face one or two judgments. Look at your neighbor and say, you're going to face one or two judgments. I want you to get this. You ready? The first one is a great white throne of judgment. Now, when it says white, it means perfection. White throne of judgment. What does the Bible say about that? And I saw a great white throne, and the one sitting on us, Jesus, and the earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. The Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess on earth and below the earth that Jesus is the Lord of all. It's not right what's going on. One day it's all going to be made right. Next week I'll give you an illustration to help you understand time and how God works in history. Why he's taking so long to come back and why we have to suffer. That's next week. You don't want to miss next week. Did I mention that already? You want me? Okay. And I saw a great white throne, and the one sitting on it, the earth and the sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. The dead. And the books were opened. Now, it's not hard to believe anymore now, is it? With all the computer technology we have today, they, they have everything on you, by the way. And that's human record keeping. The books are open, including the book of life. What's the book of life? When you give your life to Jesus, all right, my dad was 16 years old. The first thing that Jesus told my father in a vision, he says, David, I love you, and your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. My dad had no idea what the Lamb's book of life was. God spoke to him. He's 88 years old, never had another experience like that. But his name is written in the Lamb's book of life. What does that mean? That you're saved. You're redeemed. God's protected you, okay? So. And the books were open, including the book of life. Verse 15. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Oh, my gosh. This is so archaic. Give me a break. No, my friends. You see, God loves us so much. And he doesn't want to see any more suffering. And listen, sin destroys and it brings suffering. It would be the most unloving thing for God to do to let this go on forever and ever. That's why he's brought Jesus. If it didn't matter to him, he would have not sent Jesus. He would have sent money. He would have sent a philosophy. He didn't send money, didn't send goods. He sent himself. It matters that much, and he loves you that much, and he wants none to perish. Please understand the heart of God. Pastors may want to go to hell, but Jesus does not. Okay? So. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of, hell, uh, book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So we will face one or two judgments, the great right throne of judgment or the judgment seat of Christ, which is called the Bema seat, which we get the word from the Olympics. When someone would do something in the Olympics, they would judge the person based upon their performance. So God does judge us, and we do get rewards. There's no communism in heaven. 
I just want to let you know, some people will have more rewards than others. Well, that's not fair. It's tough. That's the way it is. We all go to heaven, but people will be, have different gifts based upon how they live their lives. Which, again, we'll talk about next week. You don't want to, guys, you don't want to miss next week. I just want to let you know. Okay. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil, we're all going to stand before it. Now, this is important. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please the Lord. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to conclude with a little more clarity about how we're going to be judged as believers. In 1 Corinthians 3.12, it says this. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation, basically, this is talking about how you live your life. Okay? If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, okay, those can handle fire. They're changed in the fire, but they still retain money of their value. However, wood, hay, and straw is burnt up. There's nothing left. Okay. So now anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, or precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. Am I pastoring this church because I have a problem with my self-identity and I need to be liked by people? And I just want to feel good about myself and feel I'm important. I could be on a stage with a microphone and be above everyone else. I want to be seen as important. If that's my goal for doing this church, I'll get into heaven, but I'll have no rewards. But... If I'm up here realizing I'm just like one of you, and I want to see you know Jesus, because one day you're going to have to face him, and I want to see you make a difference in the world, and that God loves you, and he's crazy about you, and he's got good plans for you, and my desire and, deser and my discernment and desire is to see you come to know Christ and change the world, and I'm doing it for the right reason, I'll get great rewards. I wish I could say my, 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 um, my motivations are always correct. I constantly have to readjust them all the time. I do, for everything that I do. If you're married, you have a spouse that lets you know. Praise the Lord for the Holy Spirit and Sandra. Each one's work will become manifest for the day we'll discover. So you can live your life, and, and you do it all for the wrong reasons. You said, everybody, let's make sure that what we're doing, we're doing it for God. We're doing it in worship. Because one day we'll give an account for how we live our life. We're not talking about heaven and hell here. Listen to this. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Why do you want to be in the worship team? Why do you want to have a Bible study? Why do you want to have a ministry? Well, I want to be seen as a man of God. Whoop, there's your reward. You get nothing on the other side of heaven. So this church, we're not impressed with, we don't care about talent as much as we care about your heart. I'd rather have some up here that can barely sing. Well, not really. But anyhow, I'd rather, seriously, I'd rather have somebody that is not as gifted and has a heart for God than someone that's amazing. I've been to some places where the worship team was off the charts. I mean, the singers were amazing. The instrumentals were fine. I'm like, yeah, it was a great performance, but there was no, no worship. Then I went to a youth worship night with 14-year-olds that could barely play three chords, and the fire of God fell because their hearts were in the right place. There's a vast difference, everybody. You see, each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss though he himself will be saved, but only as through the fire. I'm going to ask the worship team to make their way up. So, I hope you understand what we're talking about here. Everything you do matters to God. And how we behave here and what we do here will affect us for eternity. Don't waste your life like the rich man. Don't just go after the American dream and hope you can retire someday. That's not your design and that's not your purpose. Everything we should say, Lord, what do you want me to do? If you're in a nursing home and you have dialysis, you've lost most of your hearing and you cannot see, God still has a plan for you. You can pray for your grandchildren. You can pray for the country. The prayers of a righteous man and a woman availeth much. Don't despise the season you're in. If you're in the winter of life, you can't be on the beach in a bathing suit. God has a purpose for you if you're 15 or you're 58 or you're 95. Don't waste your life. It's not about comfort zones. Yes, you want to invest money. Yes, you want to have an inheritance for your children's children. But the reason why is so you can do the work of the Lord. 
I'm so proud of my mom and dad. My mom's in heaven looking down, I believe, at different times. And my father tries to retire, but he can't. Dad, what? he said to retire like five times. I said, Dad, what are you doing? He said, Eric, I got so much love. All the love I used to give your mother, I don't have anyone to give to, so I'm pouring it on people. He's counseling people that are suicidal. He's doing funerals. He's visiting people in, in nursing homes, and he could barely walk himself. He says, I want to go out for God in a flame. I don't just want to sit on a porch someplace. I want to leave it all on the field. All on the field. That when I get off the field, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to collapse and win the game. The American dream is God's nightmare. Are we going to be different? Let's pray. Lord, I, I just thank you so much, God. Lord, I'm passionate about this because you're passionate about it. You want none to perish but all to come to the faith. And, Lord, we want to live a life worth living. And, Jesus, you paid the price on the cross that if we will give our lives to you completely, we can be with you both now and forevermore. And, Father, we want to send our treasures ahead in heaven where moth and rust and thieves do not break in. For where our heart is, there is our treasure. Lord, we want our heart and our mind to be in heaven that we can have eternal impact because our eyes and our thoughts are on you, Jesus. Lord, I pray you bless my friends right now this morning. In Jesus' name. If you could look up here, I want to conclude with this. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person wins, gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we for eternal prize. You see, I want to hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to look towards Jesus, the author and creator of my life. I want to run towards the prize, the upper calling of Christ Jesus. Listen, everybody, if you're in a race running, the, the moment you look at your neighbor, you, you begin to lose steam, and you'll lose the race. The people that win races and relay races and any kind of uh, run race, they have to look straight ahead, and they have to look straight ahead, not look to the right, not look to the left, but look to Jesus. I'm going to run to Jesus. I'm going to leave it all in the field, and that's how you win. Comparing yourself to other people will ruin you. Don't you want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant one day? You see, God's not asking you to run, run, run someone else's race. He's asking you to run your race. Stop trying to run someone else's race. You're not called to be somebody else. You're called to be the divine version of you. And you matter, no matter how big, no matter how small, no matter how great. No matter how tall or small, it doesn't make a difference. You do what God's called you to do. Stop looking at your neighbor and comparing yourself. It's the devil's trap. Don't do it. Celebrate your friend's success. But keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen? Amen.